from Gary Lineker to God, and now even the coronation key. She has opinions on many matters. My next guest is an outspoken author and self-confessed reluctant atheist who doesn't shy away from speaking his mind on social media. I'm delighted to say that uh, David Bedeal is here. His new book is called The God Desire. David, thanks for joining us. Good to have you on the programme. Um, I've read the book, cover to cover, and... Right. It seems as if it's almost a love letter to the God that you wish existed. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way of putting it. I mean, it's a slightly unrequited love letter, <laughs> isn't it? Because yes. basically I think that God doesn't exist, and I also think that if I was to be pushed on why I think God doesn't exist, it's nothing to do with, oh, what existed before the Big Bang or the problem of evil in the world. It's because I so deeply want God to exist, and I believe that many people deeply want God to exist, that he's a wish fulfillment thing. That God, if I'm going to call him he for the minute, is someone who we really, really want to exist, to give our lives meaning, to hope that there's something after death. And the, we hope this so fervently that we've created him as an idea to sort of solve the the feeling that we have that there should be something out there. Uh, and yeah, the letter is, it's not one of these atheist books that just ridicules religion and makes fun of religion because as you may know, I'm Jewish and I, I deeply feel my Jewish identity. And that's part of what I'm trying to sort out here is how I can be, you know, someone who feels that identity and not believe in God. And people so will, we, people will be confused really, well, I'm put by that. that. On the next book. It's a love letter to the God who doesn't exist. Vanessa Feltz. It's going to be on the next cover. With Christmas pleasure. Book. You can put it on a T-shirt, on a tea towel, <laughs> you can put it wherever you like. But, but I think people might be confused at the, I suppose, the, the profundity of your feeling of Jewishness and being Jewish and mm. your conviction that there is no God, because they will probably think, they may not, but they probably will think that Judaism is a religion, at the centre of that religion is God, one God, just one. Um, it's not often an avenging God and doing all sorts of things to generations who've disrespected him and all of that, but at least one God in the very middle of it. And mm. if you don't believe that that God exists, how can it be that you have such a passionate, intimate, emotional, constant relationship with being Jewish and Jewishness? And it is a bit of a difficult one to unravel, I think. Yeah, not for you, though, is it? You understand it. Not for uh, me, no. Most, most Jews do understand <laughs> it. Uh, I tell this story, which some people may have heard already, but it's a true story about how a couple of Hanukkahs ago, I was phoned up by my local rabbi. I wasn't even aware that I had a local rabbi because, of course, I don't really go to synagogue. Uh, but I have one, apparently, and he phoned me up and he said, will you come and light the menorah, the big candelabra, the Jews light at Hanukkah. Will you be the person, the celebrity, we can't get, get Vanessa Feltz this year. Will you be the person <laughs> who comes and lights it? And I didn't really want to do that because I'm lazy. So I said, no, I, I'm afraid I'm an atheist, Rabbi. And he said, well, so am I. And I thought, blimey, clearly most Jews are, which is what I actually think. I mean, not all Jews, obviously, but I do think that Jewishness is often more about culture and family and tradition and heritage and pickled herring and comedy than it is about God. And I also even think that for, for Orthodox Jews, because I think that Orthodox Judaism is more about the here and now, uh, about the codes and the observances that you live your life by now, rather than this notion that maybe other religions have of a divine character that is more about the life hereafter and more about the supernatural, I think. So one maybe the, there, there is something innately Jewishness about my atheism. One of the, one of the uh, parts of the book that really resonated with me enormously was the bit where you're perfectly happy and leading a blissful life, and then you realise, you find out, that at some point you're going to die. You suddenly had intimations of your own mortality, and it absolutely yeah. ruins everything. That's it. It's just never the same again. I remember that moment very clearly. Obviously, I've never recovered from it. You have never recovered covered from it and you remember what your mother said to you in an oh, attempt so there's something you're not saying here which well, is you... i was six yeah i happened. know you were six <laughs> see i know but you're not saying it i think the audience at home might be thinking oh what when he was 47 I no was six. I'm I, was quite... six. I assumed everyone would realize you were a child you were a child you were six and it yeah. whoa descended upon you everything yeah, no, that I you thought my, you were all your equilibrium was... just went out the window so so tell us what your mum said when she was trying to say well you will die but it'll all be fine don't worry about it too much you're right you're right i was having a blissful ish life in gladstone park in dollis hill in 1974 uh and you know playing football with my dad and generally having a nice time and then i sort of understood that people die uh, and it made me very frightened and my mum said to me don't worry uh, it's death is fine it's just like a long sleep from which you never wake up and the thing is, my whole life, I've been an insomniac. 
<laughs> uh, I think it's because I then became frightened to go to sleep again. Uh, and, you know, no harm to my mother. She was obviously trying her best. Uh, but I think that, yeah, at the heart, uh, God is about death. I think God, we are the only animals that seem to have an idea that we die. And the thing that then terrifies us is that's it. There's no meaning to life. It's all over. Uh, and so what we need to do is think that there's something more. And by the way, a lot of atheists that I've read in the past completely scorn the idea, like Bertrand Russell said, oh, I scorn people who worry about their own oblivion. I'm not like that. I'm a frightened mess of a man, and I worry about that sort of thing all the time. And I'm not one of these atheists who dismiss people who are worried about that. I think we should all cop to the fact that we're all frightened about death and dying and meaningless. And so I feel in me the yearning for something that will help all that, which is God. Uh, but sadly, I can't believe in him. And if anything, it solidifies my sense that he doesn't exist, how much that troubles me. Did you read what Dame Joan Bakewell said this week about death? Because she's 90, she's having 91. chemotherapy for colon cancer, and she gave an interview in which she said she feels very serene about death. I don't... I think she is an atheist. I'm not 100% sure, but I think she is. And she said, I feel yeah. serene about death. She said, so many of my friends have done it. I feel yeah. sure that I can do it too. In other yeah. words, she didn't seem to feel scornful yeah. or worried or perturbed about oblivion. She seems to be perfectly cool and chilled about being cool and chilled yeah. forever. Well, some people are, uh, and Joan, I can imagine, is one of those people. And perhaps when I get to 91 uh, and I've had colon cancer, I will feel the same way. Uh, I mean, I, I, what I would say is I'm talking about a sort of mass psychology here. Yes. So obviously lots of individuals have come to terms with death, have come to terms with mortality, probably better than I have. But I think on mass, if you look at the fact that the creation over many different cultures, many different legends that look at the world and think, well, there must be a way of outsmarting death. There must be a way in which miracles happen. The, every culture creates legends that essentially say, we are more than this. And what, could, what that makes me believe is that every culture has the same need, has the same God desire. So that doesn't mean, of course, that lots of individual people can find ways around it. And there are ways around it. I mean, my way around it is laughter, actually, uh, more than serenity. I think that the only thing you can do with death and meaninglessness and the fact that life is basically chaotic and kind of useless most of the time is it's funny. It's funny. There's this phrase I quote in the book, which is kind of chilling, but it makes me laugh as well, which uh, I saw in a, a, a comedy show that Arthur Smith, the comedian, did. He quoted this line, the living are just the dead on holiday. <laughs> and it sort of frightened me, but at the same time, I thought it was funny. And I think that is the way through for me, is comedy. And you say in the book that there are occasions when you might catch yourself praying, very, very yeah. serious ones. Heaven forbid there was something to be terribly wrong. God forbid with somebody you actually love and really care about. And you notice my use of the phrase God forbid there. I don't know if I'm using it figuratively, literally. I definitely did pray out of the roof of my convertible mini for my daughters to find suitable husbands. And it did work. They did find them. Um, so I don't know what was going on there. But, but, but you, you say you might... Catch yourself praying, maybe. I don't, I, no, I don't just catch myself. I mean, I'm, you see, that's the point. I'm a, I'm a, this is a book about being a reluctant atheist, indeed a sort of vulnerable atheist, which I think is the thing that most people don't associate with atheism. I think they associate atheism perhaps with like the way that Richard Dawkins is or Christopher Hitchens or other people they might have read who are very, very confident about the fact that they are here for a second in the universe and that's it and that's fine. And I'm not like that. I'm not. And I'm someone who definitely, if things are going wrong in my life or if people I love might be in trouble, I'm definitely going to say, oh, I wish these people were going to be OK. I wish everything going to be fine. And where am I looking when I'm saying up. that? I'm looking for the sky. Celestially, you're looking up, yeah. up, up, up. I am, yeah. OK, because less people... people feel that this is a very serious and maybe somewhat macabre uh, conversation mm -hmm. that we're having. Let me just say, the book is called David Baddiel, The God Desire. I read it on the train to Orpington. I was on the way to a kosher farm this morning. Did you know there was such a oh, thing wow. as that? So it felt no. apposite and spiritually appropriate and everything. I've <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed it, as anybody watching this can see, so I highly recommend it. Uh, but, David, it's true that you're not only tweeting seriously about death, mortality and God, but also about the coronation quiche. What did you have well, to say that, about well, that this morning? You say that, but it is about death, because I, <laughs> I said, kill me now, I think, is what I said when I saw a picture of it. Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, it wasn't a great big anti-royalist statement. It was more that the picture that I think it was the Guardian newspaper used of the particular quiche was so depressing, <laughs> uh, it, like such a depressing piece of food, that I thought the idea that we should all be celebrating looking at this quiche made me feel very, very down indeed, more down than mortality, uh, I think, that, uh, that we were all going to have to eat this. Also, 
quiche, I, not from a real men don't eat quiche point of view, from a sort of what is it, right? It's not even like very, it's not vegan or anything. Yeah, like I think if you're going to go for something that is modern and not a great joint of meat as the coronation thing, go for something that's like maybe like a plant-based burger, right? That's what I'd quite Ooh. like. Ouch. No, I love a plant-based burger. I'm a oh, big fan of the plant-based burger. You like a plant-based burger? Well, now you've said that, there's no going back from that whatsoever. David Bedill, it's been an honour. It always is. Thank you so much for joining me.